So we've been working on the migration of our applications from the Kubernetes cluster to the OpenShift cluster. So one of the things that I do in the Kubernetes cluster is I use Cert Manager to manage my TLS certificates for public internet facing services such as Home Assistant, for example, where I use an app on my phone to connect to Home Assistant and then control things or view things that are happening around my house. And that requires that we have a valid TLS certificate. So to get a valid TLS certificate, we can use Cert Manager to talk to Let's Encrypt and that will create a valid TLS certificate and save it as a secret in Kubernetes and then apply that secret as the TLS certificates and the key to the ingress that we create. Now in OpenShift we tend to use routes instead of ingresses. We can use ingress but we have the concept of routes. So we can see here I've got a couple of routes created for my Home Assistant deployment. Now, routes currently in the current state don't work with Cert Manager. So the way Cert Manager works is saves that certificate and key as a, as a secret in Kubernetes. And then that secret is then applied to your ingress. So we can't do that with routes. We need to actually tell it what those certs and keys are. But what we can do is still use ingress, which is really handy because it means that we can just create an ingress like we would any other time and it will be then translated into an OpenShift route. So I wanted to spend some time today in this video looking at how Cert Manager works, how you can debug Cert Manager issues because it can be a little bit finicky to get running, and also take a look at how OpenShift manages that translation of ingresses to routes. So if we take a look well, actually, let's first take a look at the console here. So here's my, my routes in the OpenShift cluster that I've created for my Home Assistant deployment. Now, if we take a look at the installed operators and we go to Cert Manager, under here we can see that this has created certificates. So you don't need to create an ingress to get a certificate. You can just create one of these certificate resources. So for example, this one here, if we take a look, we can see that this one was created as a part of ingress and it's saving it into the has triple who cm tls secret and it's going to use the dns name has triple who.com so if we have a look at some of the other resources under cert manager we can see we have the certificate request resource so that actually creates a certificate request that will go out and talk to um, let's encrypt and get that certificate back. And if we have a look at the workflow for this, we can basically see that the optional step is creating the ingress. Then first we create the certificate, which then triggers a certificate request. Once this is validated and prepared um, to be sent to Let's Encrypt, it will create an order and a challenge. And the challenge basically appears as a route inside of OpenShift that has a special string at the end of it so Let's Encrypt will curl that from the server, provided it gets the right response to the challenge, it will issue the certificate. So this works through how to troubleshoot each of those stages, and this is really handy to have on hand while you're trying to get this set up and get this working. Um, basically, yeah, tr troubleshooting the certificate first, seeing if it's working, um, checking the certificate request, so it's creating that request, then we check the issuer, make sure the issuer or the cluster issuer in my case is actually working and it's not throwing any errors. Provided all that's working, we go over to the Acme certificates troubleshooting. And here we look at uh, the order. So we can check the order to see whether the order has been created and if there's any issues that are pending for that order. Then we can go down and troubleshoot the challenge. Now during this process, it does a self verification step so you need to be able to resolve the url that you're trying to get a certificate for locally on your system so when i create a, an ingress for house.triplewho.com i need to have that that dns resolvable and i need openshift or cert manager of the pod running to be able to verify that that route works now that actually requires in my environment that i have internal dns pointing to ha proxy because if it just tries to reach it from public DNS, it'll get my public IP address and it will try and loop back route into my router, which doesn't work. So what we need is to have 
um, some split domain DNS management where we manage the internal records separately on my own DNS server. So when OpenShift looks that up, it gets my internal IP address and it's able to then route through HAProxy and pull down that secret to validate that the, the challenge is actually actually responding from that route. But when Lights Encrypt does it, it's going to resolve that address from public DNS. So I need to make sure my public DNS has either a wildcard pointing for that domain name to my public IP address, or I need to go and set up individual DNS records for the routes that I want to create in the public system pointing at my public IP address. So basically what we can do is we can create an ingress. So we'll go ahead and actually create an ingress now. So we'll just go create ingress and we'll delete all this. And we will copy an ingress that I've already worked on previously. So this one. Now we're going to create some, some different information here. So we'll call this one Assistant 2. Um, it still needs to point to the same app, Home Assistant. The host, we can call it Home Assistant 2. Home Assistant 2. And we need to point at a service, so pointing at the right service, and our secret name. So we'll call this one House Triple Home 2 CMTLS. So we'll go ahead and we will create that ingress. Now what we'll see is that that will create a route. So we can see it's created a route here and that has a solver. So we can see there that it created that solver. Now that solver is what's being used by Lights Encrypt. So it's resolving that address and it's coming in through my router, which I've forwarded, port forwarded ports 80 and 443 TCP through to HAProxy. HAProxy will then load balance that through to my OKD environment, which will then match on that host name, match that route, and it will return that challenge to Let's Encrypt, and then it can validate that I am indeed the right person. Now, if we wanted to see that, that loopback error that I'm talking about, I'm not using my home DNS at the moment, I'm using public DNS. So if I click on this route, we can see that I go to my PFSense router. That's not what we want. That's not what we want OpenShift to do when it tries to validate that. So what we've done in my internal DNS server is just created a wildcard for anything.triplewho.com and that points it to my HAProxy server internally. So we go back and have a look at Cert Manager now. And we have a look at certificates. We can see there's a new certificate and it's using that name for the secret that we created. So we have a look in here. We can see all the details about the certificate that was created. If we have a look at the certificate requests, we can see here it is here again. So this is the certificate request that was created. So this basically generates a certificate and it sends it off as a request to Let's Encrypt for it to then authorize my certificate. The certificate is saved and the challenge and the order. So here's the order. The challenge is removed though. So this is the order. And this is, remember, the last step of that. So we can see that the challenge has used a token. It's sent it off to the Let's Encrypt server. So this creates this, the certificate and it uses the, so you can see it generated the token. It's using the HTTP 01 type. It has then gone away and verified that this identifier works and has issued the certificate. If we have a look at our ingress, we can see the ingress is here working. And we can see we now have this route. So we have a look in the route, and we have a look, well just here should be fine. So we can see it's pasted in the certificates. So even though we can't use a route to work with Cert Manager, this ingress still works. So let's take a look at why that ingress still works. We go to the terminal and we do oc get ingress class, and we do oyaml. We can see that this is the default ingress class for OpenShift, and what it's doing is using this controller called ingress to route. So let's have a look at what ingress to route actually is. So we can see here in the OpenShift controller manager we define an ingress for a new controller and if we do a search for ingress to route we can see that this one is the ingress to route controller and it goes through and defines what an ingress to route controller actually looks like. So as part of that it's looking for those TLS certificates so we take a look here 
we can see that it's keeping an eye on the secrets and it's looking for any secrets that are of type TLS. So any secrets that are of type TLS, we're keeping an eye out for and we're seeing in vain match what's defined in our ingress. So we keep walking through the code. We can see that we then use the TLS secret and we check to make sure it's a valid TLS secret. If it is valid, then we save it as the TLS secret variable. Keep walking through the code here. So when we're creating the route in the route spec, this is the part where the route is actually created, we define the TLS certificate right here and we use this function called TLS config for ingress. And if we go to that, we can see that this is going through and it's checking our ingress and it's pulling out the TLS information. And if TLS is enabled, then we use the termination policy for edge termination and we define the certificate and the key coming from that secret. So this is actually really cool. It makes it really easy to be cross compatible with Kubernetes environments if what you're traditionally used to is using Kubernetes for your ingresses. It means you can take those same YAML files that you're using in Kubernetes and apply them with very minimal changes into OpenShift and that will create valid TLS certificates that you can then use for your applications. So we go back to this route and we have a look here. What we'll do is we'll just add a host entry to this. As I said, I'm not using my home DNS at the moment, so let's add a host entry for it. So now we've added a host entry on the local system for that URL. Now we'll go to the URL and we can see that it does indeed take me through to home system. And we can see that the session is encrypted and it's using our valid certificate coming from Let's Encrypt. So that, that has been the migration of Home Assistant over to OpenShift. And now I can start shutting down things in the Kubernetes environment. So the one problem that I have is that um, home monitoring stuff that's running on my Raspberry Pi that I need to add to this cluster. So what we might do for that is create a Kubernetes service, which is using node port, and then try and see if we can point Prometheus at that service that runs on the Raspberry Pi and scrape the metrics that way. So we'll go back to our terminal and we will export the kube config for the Kubernetes cluster. Now we'll do let's see, get SVC and home on. So we have this temp exporter. So this is the one we want to create a node port service for. So we do OC get SVC and home on. O YAML on temp exporter. So to make it easier, we'll just put that into a file. And we will edit that file. So we don't need any of this stuff anymore. Now we want to create a node port service. So a node port service is a service that is exposed on all of the nodes in a Kubernetes cluster. So by doing this, my hope is that we can then reach it by just pointing it to the IP address of the Raspberry Pi on that port, and we'll be able to scrape those metrics from Prometheus. So what we want to do is look up what it, what it takes to define a node port service. So we need to go in here and we don't want cluster IPs. We can remove all of this. So in the type, we want to define node port. Node port. Selector will be the same. Session affinity can go away. Um, now under ports, we want to specify a node port. So we're going to specify here, node port. And we'll give it, so for our node port, we'll just give it 30. 1080. Now let's try and create that service. So now we can see that's been created. So if we try and cut, well, get nodes OY, we'll get the IP address of the Raspberry Pi, which we can see is here, and 
now will curl Raspberry Pi on 30080. Cool, so we're getting something back. And we can see we're now able to query those metrics. So let's jump back over to our web browser. And we want to go to the monitoring namespace now. So in the monitoring namespace, we go to workloads, we go to secrets, and we've got this additional scrape config secret. So we have a look here, we can see that this here is what's defining all of the scrape endpoints. And we can see we've got temp one sensor down the bottom. So let's edit this secret. And we want to go down to the bottom where we've got the temp one one. And now we want to paste in that address. So we'll save that and Back to our pods, everything seems to be running, so let's go to Grafana. So all of our endpoints are up. We can see that it was last scraped five seconds ago. If we go back to Grafana, we can see that we now have the temperature in our dashboard. And now we have the humidity and the pressure. So we can see that it's now working. So let's just change the refresh here and see if this settles down after a couple of minutes. Okay, that appears to be now settling down. So now we're scraping directly from the Raspberry Pi. So we don't really need all of the other VMs that are running that OpenShift environment. So let's try shutting them down and see if that service stays up. So we'll go to cockpit. We're going to go to our virtual machines. And we're just going to start shutting down the, the Kubernetes environment. But maybe before we do that, let's just cordon some of those nodes. So we'll try and drain some of the nodes off of our um, master one. And we'll just check for the pods that are still running there. So we still had a couple of pods running here. I don't think all of these are going to be able to drain successfully. So let's let's shut down that one now. So we'll shut down our um, our first master node. We might we might just leave one of these running and one of the worker nodes but we really need to free up some space so that we can start to move the workloads that are running on the, the OpenStack compute node over here so that we can reprovision that node as an OpenShift worker node. All right, so we've put off migrating these VMs from the OpenStack compute node to the new Fedora server for long enough. Now that we've managed to migrate our applications from Kubernetes over to OpenShift and we're able to query that last remaining Raspberry Pi, let's start this migration process so this is the OpenStack compute node. Now, on here, we can see that we have three VMs that are running. I think only two of these I really care about, so let's just double check what they are. So dump XML2, and we're gonna grep for Nova colon name. So that one is the IPA server. Ford is the work one, the one that I really care about. And 77 is a dev stack VM. So I don't really care about the dev stack VM. I can just rebuild that whenever. So what we're going to do is I'm going to exit IRC on my other terminal. And I'm going to exit and power off the VM. Okay, so let's take our really important Fedora work on first. I'm going to go to var lib nova instances. Now, we need to know which one of these is our Fedora work VM. So, we can see that it is most probably this one here. So let's see it into that directory. Now, we want the disk, obviously. 
So we can see that this one here is our disk. So if we do, so we do file disk, we can see that that one is a QMU QCOW image. So we want to SCP that over to our other server. And we're going to put it in varlib. Just for now, maybe we'll move it to one of our other larger storage pools when we get there. Now we're going to do this for all three of them, and when we start them up, we're going to do it exactly the same way that we did from um, moving from over into Fedora Server. So we're going to change the interface type in the XML, make sure it's connected to an open vSwitch network on the correct bridge, and then we're going to power it up, and we're going to see if it works. And if anything fails at this stage, we can still just start the VM up here. It's not a massive issue. So I'll pause the video there, and we'll come back once this is fully transferred. Okay, that process finished now, so let's go over and see if we can import it and see if it's just as easy as those previous ones were. So we don't want it to immediately start the VM. Now we'll go here. And we want to bash edit. Okay, so we go in here, we're going to edit the interface. So again, just everything we've already done before. So OVN, our interface type will be bridge. Source bridge is BR Cloud. Model type will stay as vert.io. We need virtual port type. Virtual port type equals open B switch slash close that one off and then we want VLAN tag ID equals four and then VLAN. So is there anything else we need? Uh, the bridge the source bridge Okay, let's try and start it and see if it works. Didn't work. Ah, so it looks like our boot device is somewhere different. We need to SCP this over as well. Now this is going to be interesting because I don't have that path. Maybe we need to make that path. Let's just send it to here for now. Okay, so after copying over that file that was in the, the base directory, valid Nova instances underscore base, we see the VM is now booting. And better yet, it's actually booted completely. Great, so we can see there we're able to log in. And we can see it has an IP address, which isn't the IP address I wanted it to have, but that's okay because we're not using OpenStack DHCP here, so that makes sense for why it changed. I need to add a DHCP entry in my DHCP server if I want it to stay the same. So I'm not too worried about that changing for now. That, that's great, I'm really happy with that. So let's leave that one. And let's go and do the other one. So. The other one was IPA. Okay, so it looks like that will be this one. See in here, 
and we will just get a size of that disk so we understand what we're dealing with. So 30 gig, so it's pretty big but not, not massive. So disk, now we're going to send it to we send it var lib libvert images and we're going to call it IPA Because if I just send it straight over there, I'll end up overriding the disk that I have for my Fedora work VM, which we obviously don't want to do. So again, I'm just going to let this run. I'll pause the video. We'll come back once that one's finished. So for this one, we'll actually specify the uh, uh, the MAC address in our DHCP server so that it gets the right IP address since my IOTA what is communicating with it. It'll just make my life easier. So we'll do source bridge and we're going to do BR cloud again. Leave that one. So virtual port type equals open vSwitch. We do our VLAN. Okay, and now let's try and start that one up. So failed, so again, failed with the same issue, so we're just going to copy over that base image again to this node. So it's going to uh, lib nova instances underscore base. So we'll send that one over and then that VM should start up as well and hopefully with the correct IP address this time and then everything will keep working. So once we verify that that is able to start correctly, we'll wrap up the video and leave it there for today. And in the next one, we will go ahead and reprovision that OpenStack server as an OpenShift compute node. And then we'll start to do some CMV or container native virtualization using kubevert to bring up some VMs on that one and redeploy an OpenStack environment using the triple O OSP director operator. So I'll pause the video, we'll come back, make sure the VM starts, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, so that has finished transferring now, so we'll go back to the screen share. Let's head on over to Cockpit, and let's run that VM. Cool, so we're running now, we want to make sure it comes up with that correct IP address, hopefully it will. So we can see um, VS Code here is opening remote down the bottom and it's actually connecting through to that work VM. So all of my work happens then on that on that VM, which is quite handy because I can work from like my laptop, so I can work from this system, or you know, if all I had available to me was a Chromebook, I could work from a Chromebook. So it, it, it's actually quite handy. So the main purpose of this video is just a short one to explain how Cert Manager works and how we can create those ingress ingress. Um, objects in OpenShift as well as Kubernetes so we can reuse those manifests which is really handy. Do a bit of an explanation about how that works and how we use that default, in, that default OpenShift ingress class to translate those ingress objects into route objects. Um, take a bit of a look at how Cert Manager ended up creating those certificates, saving them as secrets, etc, etc. And I'll leave all the troubleshooting information for walking through that. There's actually a really handy video on YouTube as well that I will link in the description below. Um, he did a great job of explaining how Cert Manager works in Kubernetes. And then I've applied that information to you know, how I troubleshoot Cert Manager moving forward. We looked at how to create a node port. So we created a node port for the Raspberry Pi and then we've pointed Prometheus at that endpoint so that we can actually pick up those metrics without all of the infrastructure that I have running for Kubernetes. Um, we shut down some of those those VMs that were running the Kubernetes environment and I'm going to have to start deleting the deployments because it's still going to keep um, trying to keep that deployment alive for like Home Assistant, Bitwarden, Prometheus, Grafana, everything else that's running there. I'll have to start deleting them. And then we will eventually remove them completely, add the Raspberry Pi into the OpenShift cluster, and add in the Open 
OpenStack server into the OpenShift cluster as well. So they will be upcoming videos. So just a nice short one, bit of a recap there. I'll leave all the links to the information that I've shared here today in the, in the description below. And I will see you next week when we try and free up that server and add it in as an OpenShift node.